Hello and welcome to African American Health Matters. This is Ed and Pat Sanders with health tips and information because your health does matter. The information in this broadcast is not intended to substitute for personal medical advice. Now before making any decision about your health, please consult a physician or a qualified health care professional. Our organization has over 103 partners across the country who are dedicated to patient education, advocacy, and finding ways to better access health and disease resources for African Americans. This broadcast of African American Health Matters is one of the health outreach tools used to reach millions. Thanks to Cyber Station USA and thanks to you for tuning in. Over the past few weeks, we've interviewed physicians about a number of diseases and health matters that relate to our health and discuss how various diseases and health issues specifically affect African Americans. There's so much information we've gotten from our physicians, we want to thank them for taking the time to educate us about African American health matters. This week, we want to start wrapping up some of our previous interviews, so for this show, We're going to have a full half hour of doctors we've talked to in the past, continuing their discussions about various diseases. Dr. Alfie Breland Noble is a professor and director of Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science at Duke University Medical Center. She's going to be talking to us about depression, bipolar disorder, dementia, and Alzheimer's. Doing that family background, forcing us to talk about what's going on in our families so that we can get a sense of, is this something that I may be impacted by? Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the best things that we can do. But getting in front of the professional getting the diagnosis so that you know exactly what it is that you're dealing with that, so that you know mm-hmm. whether or not you're dealing with Alzheimer's or a different type of dementia because different types of dementia are going to require different treatments. So the primary care physician would be a good, because I would always have thought of psychologists, which is really going to cause a lot of bucking on a part of a road, because they are definitely not going to go there. Yes, I think so. <laughs> I think, so I'm a big believer in Stay with what you know and work okay. and begin with what's comfortable. Okay. Because I know from personal experience, if I try to get a family member, and I just, I'm a mental health professional. I know. I try to, and I feel like I know what I'm doing. Yeah, you if do. I try to encourage a family member. They balk at me. I know. So I think that is, you know, for many of us, the primary care physician is the person who's catching everything. I like the that. The one who's, that's the front line defense. I love it. We feel comfortable talking to. I love it. So what we would do, and let's, let's look at a, a, a theoretical strateg- strategy here. You've got a father, mother, grandfather, brother who you feel is, is really showing signs of alt- Alzheimer's. So what we say to them is, you know what, let's, let's check out the doctor. You've already talked to their primary care physician and told them what's up. Yep. Now you're going to tell that member the doctor wants to take a look at you. Just make sure everything's okay. They're going to check you out from head to toe and just kind of guide them, gently guide them to that position. Would you, so is that the way? So what's going to happen probably in the best of all worlds with this family member whom we love so much, after they go to the primary care physician and the primary care physician says, oh, well, I, I do think you probably want to get a second opinion from a specialist. I agree with you totally that the next step is going to be they're either going to send you to a neurologist who's going to check out what's going on with your brain and nervous system, Mm -hmm. or they may send you to a psychiatrist, Mm -hmm. or they may send you to a psychologist. And Mm -hmm. once you go to that person, those are people, and let me just say, the people that you want to go to, the neurologist, the psychiatrist, or the psychologist, you really want somebody who specializes in working with older populations. Okay. you don't just want a general neurologist. You okay. don't just want a general psychiatrist. Good. You don't just want a general psychologist. Mm-hmm. You want somebody who specializes in working with uh, geriatric populations. Great. If it's, you know, a typical onset of, uh, mm-hmm. of Alzheimer's. Okay. Um, and then beyond that, what's going to happen is that person is going to be able to go through some very specific types of tests with you. Um, diagnostic exams, what they call a mental status exam, just simple things. Some of these things are pen and paper. Some of them are just having a conversation. A physical exam, the neurologist may be able to do things like brain imaging so that they can get a better sense of, or a neuropsychologist can do the same thing, so that they can take 
have the pictures of your brain. They can have this really full assessment of what's going on with your family member. And then you have a clear picture of exactly where you are in this process. Mm -hmm. Is this the beginning of Alzheimer's? Is this the beginning of a different type of dementia? And um, are we at a stage where we can do medications that may help reverse some of the damage? Mm -hmm. um, so, or are we at a stage where we really need to start thinking about um, other options? Mm -hmm. You know, what are the options available to us? So the best thing that you can do is get to that primary care because we know that people will go to the primary care doctor. Yeah, they'll go there. They'll go there. And mm -hmm. then, you, like you said, you ease them into this idea of the neurologist, the psychiatrist, or the psychologist who can really do that full, mm -hmm. clear, comprehensive assessment for you. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's tough. My, my father went through that as well. And to convince them to do something other than what's they're out of the norm is very, very difficult. Oh, yeah, it's very true. difficult. It's like you were talking about, you know, it's hard enough to get teenagers to do stuff. But, you know, a full grown adult, <laughs> and if it's your parents, yeah. you know, we know our, our parents that too. Look, I raised you, so I tell you what. That's exactly the attitude. You're right. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> Something where it takes a lot of care. So for some families, they really will have to do what they call an intervention, where you get a couple, not everybody, but you get two or three family members together and mm -hmm. just say, here are things that we've noticed. Please let us go with you. You know, mm -hmm. please let us help. Wonderful idea. Mm -hmm. And it may not always work, but it's much better to at least ask the question. And if it doesn't work the first time, my attitude is ask again. Wait a month and say, okay, you know, I noticed that you put the frying pan in the washing machine. <laughs> yeah. You need to go talk to somebody. Okay. Go ahead. So, on average, doctor, how long does Alzheimer's disease last? Oh, boy. Just it, on average. It varies. It depends on, I mean, I think once you've been diagnosed, we know that there's no cure. And so, uh, more often than not, people are diagnosed probably in, in, uh, mid, around the mid, the age of mid 60s. Hmm. Right? So, from mid 60s until you pass some people live 20 years with okay. Alzheimer's some mm -hmm. people don't live that long so mm -hmm. I think once you have it once it's been diagnosed really what you're trying to do is if it's possible to reverse effects you're trying to reverse effects if it's not possible to, possible to reverse the effects you're really trying to help that person manage and the family members manage living with the disease mm -hmm. so if you think you know you're probably looking at to be more direct if it's diagnosed at the age of 65, then you're probably looking at anywhere from 10 to 15, maybe 17, 18 years. Wow. Um, so, so, once, once, so once you get it, that's it? There's, there's yeah, no cure. once you get it, there's no cure. So once you get it, like I said, if you are able to catch it early enough, you might be able to reverse some of the negative effects. You can't stop it. Mm -hmm. It's going to be there, but you may be able to slow down mm -hmm. the progression, or you may be able to you know, reverse things, say, like depression. Mm -hmm. if, if a person is depressed along with um, having, you know, in the early stages of Alzheimer's, you can do something about that. If there's some brain damage, you might be able to um, repair some parts of that damage. But once a person gets it, it's not going away. Mm -hmm. They have it. Mm -hmm. This has been so interesting. I guess the only last thing I would ask you about this whole subject of mental health is are there any, I mean, I guess it boils down to physical health, is diet and exercise, exercising your brain and eating brain food, which, what, what, would, you, what would you call brain food? Oh, boy. Um, I tend to be a believer in, you know, you follow that, the triangle that we learned when we were all young. Oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah. You know, eating, the, eating from the major food groups. Right. I do think that um, it varies. If you ask 10 different people, you're probably going to get 10 different answers about mm -hmm. what are the best kinds of things we can eat. Mm -hmm. Personally, I would say that my approach is more global health, okay. that you really want to be taking care of managing your stress. Mm -hmm. Stress can be, it can wreak havoc on a person's body. Okay. You want to be aware of the amount of fatty foods. Now, you know we like to fry stuff. Oh, mm -hmm. we do. We like grease the oil. <laughs> <laughs> we want to be aware of yeah. limiting um, those kinds of things. I think we want to be aware of um, how many, I mean, just sweets, all those kinds I of things. I love it. You know it's not good for you. You're talking it. I'm not saying don't eat it at all. No. I'm just saying limit it. So, limit it. I think if you, you know, like I said, I tend to be a person who believes in more 
global health. So mm -hmm. if you're eating enough, obviously fruits and vegetables, um, you know, not a whole lot of red meat. I'm not saying don't eat red meat. You sure. know, limiting your intake, eating fish, yes, um, seafood, mm -hmm. eating limited. I think poultry is good for you, mm -hmm. but just limiting some of the not quite as healthy as fish and chicken types of food. I understand. Like so I understand. I think that it can really be helpful in terms of your overall health. And the more healthy you are overall, it's not that you won't get sick, but I, th I do think it helps to fight off um, some of the difficulties that we experience as we age. Mm -hmm. Wow. Did you know that African Americans have one of the highest rates of asthma? Asthma is a lung disease that makes breathing difficult for both young and old. Although there's no cure for asthma, it can be managed and treated so you or your loved ones can live a normal, healthy life. You can be as active as you want to be. The American Lung Association can help. Learn more about asthma and keep it under control by visiting www.lungusa.org or call us at 1-800-LUNG-USA. Problems with bladder control? To control the urge to rush to the toilet, you have to do a pelvic muscle contraction. Walk calmly and slowly to the bathroom. Cut out caffeine, alcohol, and sweetness. To control frequency at night, reduce evening fluids. Prop up your feet during the day. Have your prostate checked for enlargement and consider medications if it is. Call 1-800-BLADDER for more tips and details. Dr. James Race attended Texas Southern University, Case Western Reserve University graduate in biochemistry, and graduate of Meharry Medical College in 1983. With over 28 years in internal medicine, Dr. Race has been heavily involved in clinical research in diabetes, cardiovascular, and hypertension. He is an active force in the community. He is past chairman, Dallas Division of American Heart Association, African American Task Force, Executive Board AHA, Dallas Division, and Chairman AHA Minority Council. He is an active force in the community, past chairman, Dallas Division American Heart Association's African American Task Force. He recently spoke at our Fabulous 50 to Sexy at 60 dinner lecture series on hypertension. Why um, talk about diabetes? Um, here's some numbers. African Americans especially are twice as likely to be diagnosed with diabetes as, as uh, whites, uh, twice as likely to develop kidney failure and have to start dialysis as whites. Uh, one and a half times as likely to be hospitalized for diabetes complications, and over twice as likely to die from diabetes complications. Now, diabetes is an extremely complicated disease, and one thing that I tell students all the time is that if you can manage diabetes, then you can manage almost anything. And just think of it like this. Um, the reason diabetes is so important is it's about your metabolism and how your body works. Your car runs on gas. Your body runs on sugar. The difference is you go to the gas station and pump some gas. It's already been pumped out the ground, been to the refinery, and made into whatever it is that you're putting in your car. Whatever grade it is, whatever octane it is, etc. Your body is all of that. Most of your internal organs are designed to digest and do with whatever it is you put in there and convert that to sugar. That's what it's for. What it doesn't um, use gets stored as fat. Okay, that's the only way the body stores anything. It does not store sugar very well. So it only has two things it can do with it, basically. Use it or store it. Now, before you're diabetic, all this happens automatically. Your body keeps the, uh, its blood sugar between a normal range of, say, 70 to 100 or so. No matter what you eat, no matter what you drink, no matter what you do, it stays in that range. Once you become diabetic, now you have to do that. You have to control your metabolism. So you have to um, control how much you eat, when you eat it, how you eat it, what you eat. Uh, whether or not it's diabetic carrot cake or full-blown carrot cake or whatever it is. Um, cheese cake. Yeah. <laughs> um, fortunately, um, I ate before I came here, so I didn't have to partake. But I didn't do good because uh, actually a patient of uh, ours cooked for us today. 
boy, he laid it out. Uh, <coughs> so I had enough to eat for today. Um, risk factors for diabetes. Well, you already heard about weight. You're going to hear weight, weight, and more weight. Um, major risk factor for diabetes, okay? African American women have the highest incidence of being overweight or obese. Four out of every five African American women are overweight or obese. That means have a BMI, you just heard what that was, of over 25. That is the number one risk factor for diabetes, first and foremost, okay? And it doesn't take a whole lot of weight. I mean, it could be like 10, 20 pounds. You can be diabetic. Um, you could be 200 pounds overweight. And that certainly puts your risk for diabetes. So don't just think of it as being, you know, just a few. Um, since we already talked about uh, BMI, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But again, over 25 is overweight, and over 30 is obese. Now you can either lose weight by exercise, diet, and those sort of things, or you can grow taller so your BMI goes down. Uh, but I think most of us have stopped growing, and we're at the age where we start shrinking, actually. So <laughs> risk factors. Um, lack of exercise, of course, as you've heard. Um, poor dietary habits, too many calories, too many carbohydrates, eating late, skipping meals. Um, believe it or not, skipping meals is actually not the way to manage your metabolism. Um, your, you have to send your body the right metabolic signals. And so a lot of us, um, and I used to do this myself even, would skip breakfast, okay, like I did today. Um, but what happens is, if you have to send your body the right metabolic signal first thing in the morning. So just think of it like this. Um, you get up at, say, 7 o'clock in the morning. Generally speaking, your body starts to wake up a couple hours before you do. So it, it adjusts to what your routine is. Um, so metabolically, your body starts to wake up. You um, get up at 7 o'clock, bounce out of bed, ready to go, you start your day. Okay. Well. If you, if you eat, now you're sending the body its right metabolic signal, so it says, okay, you're giving us fuel. And remember, that's the only reason to eat. Forget what it tastes like, that's not good. Okay? The only thing your body cares about is the fuel and, it, and how it converts that into fuel, which is sugar. So if you give it the right signal, then it speeds up its metabolism and you can go on about your business. When you don't do that, then you're basically telling your body, you're not going to give it any fuel, so it, it's not going to do anything. Then when you call in your body to do something, you're like, because uh, you don't have any energy because you didn't send your body, you didn't give your body the right signal. Now this doesn't happen just like that, but this uh, this happens over years. Your body adjusts to your routine, and so after you get to a certain point, your body realizes that you ain't giving me any fuel, so we're not going to do nothing. <laughs> okay, and that's basically how that works. So that's what I mean by skipping meals is actually not the way to do things. Um, eating late, of course, everybody knows. You know, you eat late and then you lay on the couch, watch TV, and next thing you know, that's the you know, you're sleeping. Okay. Well, remember what you did. You put all those calories in your body. Now your body has to do something with it. You aren't making it do anything with it. So what's it going to do? Burn the fat. Okay. You get up the next morning. You <laughs> okay, so, you know, this, this, that's, that's the thing about eating late. That's why you hear this thing about, you know, don't eat two hours before you go, go to bed. Well, it's a little bit more than that because depending on when your metabolism shuts down for the night, that's not even good enough. So what you want to do is the opposite of what we all do in this country. We, we, we eat wrong. We consume most of our calories late in the day for dinner which is for most of us our biggest meal, right. when we least need it, okay? So the best thing to do is to actually give ourselves more calories earlier in the day. So I tell people your biggest meal should be breakfast or lunch, your lightest meal should be dinner, okay? Um, we don't eat like that, so, but anyway, <clears throat> that's the message. Um, carbohydrates, uh, again, carbohydrates, sugar, can convert it directly to sugar, raises your blood sugar levels. Calories, excess calories, excess sugar, excess fat, weight, diabetes, all part of the same thing. Now those are things that you can control. Now you can't control age, family history, um, 
there's increased risk of diabetes as you get older. Just because as you get older, your body metabolism is not working as well, it's slowing down. The pancreas, which produces insulin and controls your sugar, uh, starts to burn out. And that's why a lot of people, when they get to be, you know, 70s and 80s, get diagnosed with diabetes. And by the way, let me say that we're talking about type 2 diabetes, not type 1. And there, there is a difference. But as you get older, um, then you're more at risk of diabetes. Now, we aren't as concerned about it if you get it at that age because the real problem with diabetes is the long-term effects. Mm -hmm. So if you get diagnosed at 70 or 80, it's not as aggressive a disease that we're not as aggressive in treating it, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, family history, let me say something about family history because here's what I hear all day is that we talk about, we talk to patients, we say, what's your family history? They say, well, I have a family history of diabetes, everybody in my family is diabetic. Well, that's because everybody in the family eats <laughs> And at the end, I'm going to come back to that point. But everybody in this family eats the same. So if you eat the way you're taught to eat, and you're eating too many calories, too many carbohydrates, and eating late and skipping meals, then guess what? You're going to have a weight problem, and guess what? You're going to be at risk for diabetes. Okay? And that's how that works. There, now, type 1 diabetes, um, there is a genetic relationship with that. There are genes that cause type 1 diabetes, and that's why that's different. Type 2 diabetes is acquired. You actually, I'm going to almost say, I'm going to stop just short of saying that you actually make yourself diabetic, or you allow yourself to become diabetic. Okay? And it can be prevented. Okay? It doesn't have to be that way. I have a family of five diabetics. The six people in the family, five are diabetic. The only one that's not is the only one who's the way he's supposed to be. Gestational diabetes, now guys, you don't have to worry about this one. Uh, <laughs> unless you know something nobody else knows. <laughs> uh, that's a different conversation. <laughs> but, you know, if you had, um, if, if you were um, diagnosed with diabetes while you're pregnant, most of the time, after you deliver, within a few months, the diabetes goes away. But that still puts you at risk for diabetes. And actually, um, unless you do something about the risk factors, i.e. the weight, for example, within five years, most of those people who had gestational diabetes will become diabetic. So that's just something to keep in mind. Symptoms of diabetes. Um, most of you probably know this. Dry mouth, thirsty for water. Urinating more often in larger amounts, fatigue, decreased energy, unexplained weight loss, vision changes. Most people, though, don't have any symptoms. Okay? I'd say probably half the people I diagnosed with diabetes, it was totally coincidental. We just did some routine lab work, and there it was. They had no symptoms at all. So don't, don't think that I don't feel anything, I don't have anything. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Um, the thing is, if you're overweight, you're at risk. If you're not exercising, you're at risk. Okay? And that's what you need to think about. So what do you do? Well, you see a doctor get screened. It's easy to diagnose. The blood tests. Um, we have, we have um, ranges that we use. Like I said, a normal blood sugar is 70 to um, 100. Um, 101 to about 125 is considered borderline like that term, but we, we consider that borderline. And then anything over 126 is diabetes, at least, and that's, that's a fasting sugar, that's when it's done before you eat. So um, um, I have people who I've been seeing for many years, their sugar start off at 70, then five years later it's maybe 90, uh, three years later it's like 110, and I start telling them, hey, you're getting close, the train is coming to the station, you're about to get on it, okay? And so um, um, they say, well, what do I do? And I say, well, exercise, lose weight, etc. cetera. Um, we can predict almost who's going to become diabetic. I, with certain lab tests and that sort of thing, I can tell you with, that within two or three years, you're going to be diabetic. Do it all the time. Um, this is what you, and what you do about it. Nobody does it. Then they get diagnosed and then they act like they're surprised. Modify risk factors, change diet, exercise, lose weight, quit smoking, you know, all the things that we, we've heard about already and we'll get more about. Um, and then other risk factors, hypertension and cholesterol, which are not directly related to diabetes, but the same kinds of conditions that led you to be diabetic also can cause hypertension and high cholesterol and, and those sort of things. Um, 
high-concept flu member. Prevention, like I said, type 2 diabetes can be prevented. You don't have to get it. Okay? You don't have to. Just because it's in your family history, like I said, everybody in the family is the same, then you're going to have the same problems. But you don't have to get it. Um, if you do get diagnosed, accept it. And then deal with it. The biggest impediment, and going back to that first screen when I showed you everything is two or three times more likely for us, is because people deny that they have a problem. Okay, you know what you know what they say? I'm claiming that. <laughs> and I'm like, well, guess what? <laughs> you got claimed. <laughs> okay, and so. Um, I have one guy, he's been diabetic for 10 years, he's still one minute. Oh, wow, wow. And the hemoglobin A1C, which is one of the blood tests that we use to, is to follow how someone's diabetes is, is controlled, should be less than 7, which means that your average sugar is about 140, 150. Well, his is 13, which means his average sugar is about 300, 330. And he still denies it. So he won't, he, he, he only takes pills, which he has failed. He's supposed to be on insulin, but he won't take it because he's still in denial. <laughs> you can't do anything about that. <laughs> Last concept, control. Follow your doctor's recommendations for controlling your problem. Simple. You know, um, if, if diet is, has to be a part of that, then learn how to eat right. Okay? Exercise, I guarantee you that's a part of it. Most of the diabetes medicines that we actually use to treat it with actually work better the more you exercise. Okay? So the first thing people say is, well, I don't want to take medicine. Okay, lose some weight. Exercise, eat right. Okay, that's how you do that. Uh, if insulin becomes a part of that, then that's just what, what it has to be. Okay? So follow your doctor's recommendations and, and um, let you control the diabetes. Don't let it control you. It doesn't have to define you. It's a chronic disease. You can live a long time with it. I have people who've been diabetic for 50 years. Wow. Okay? And they still have all their organs and everything works fine. Wow. Okay? It can be done. Okay? It just takes a little bit of work. And like I said, acceptance and then this go from there. And I'll end with a uh, thought for the day. It has nothing to do with what I just talked about, but... <laughs> Remember that whatever you were in this life, if you come back in the next life, go on the food chain, you didn't do something right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sir. Be sure to tune in on Fridays, noon to one, for African American Health Matters on Cyber Station USA.